Imagine the transformation of our lives, communities, and nation by spending an entire weekend in the presence of Jesus. Well, why not join us for our very first Encounter Conference weekend right here in the Isle of Man, March 13th and 14th at the Villa Marina. It's gonna be a life-changing few days together, not just with the Living Hope team, but also with our good friend, Jonathan Conrath, as he ministers in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Moses once said to God, I'm not gonna budge an inch unless your presence goes with us. And as a church today, we know it's gonna be the presence of Jesus that's gonna transform our lives and our nation. If you're coming from maybe the UK or Ireland, we'd love to host you over the weekend with the church family. So please get online, let's register as soon as possible, and let's believe God for an amazing time together. So the title of this, this preach is Living Your Dreams in 2015, Abiding or Striving. I think it's fair to say too many of us are striving, and I put myself into that category. But let us look at John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is, a, is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and, and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this the Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Such an encouraging verse of, of, of the Bible. And I'll come back to that later. But for those who don't know, we're now on January the 11th. Hopefully most of you are aware of that. And many of us will have said New Year's resolutions. If you believe the facts, probably half of us who have said New Year's resolutions have already broken them. During the course of the year, if you, if you believe what you read on the internet, and that can be dangerous, but nine in ten of us will break our New Year's resolutions. Now, I'm not saying this to discourage you. And if you're one of the people still keeping to your New Year's resolution, good luck, and I hope and pray that you continue that throughout the year. But New Year's resolutions generally rely on willpower rather than God's power. The self-help books out there would give you a lot of tips to succeed. Pick only one resolution, good advice. Take baby steps, good advice. Hold yourself accountable, again, good advice. Focus on the carrot rather than beating yourself up with a stick. But all of these things are still really mo mainly focusing on your willpower. During the research for this, I actually Googled the top New Year's resolutions. It's on the internet, the top 50 New Year's resolutions. Number one, spoke to me, exercise more. Number two, eat better, that spoke to me as well. Number five, Spend less time on Facebook. Spoke to Jonathan. <laughs> Number 20, do more for charity. Number 39, go to church more. And I think there's some first-time faces here this morning, so I don't want to belittle you if this is your New Year's resolution and you're here today. Interestingly, go to church more was five below learning how to knit. <laughs> It does, it does concern you, that, doesn't it? I mean, it's funny, but it concerns me. These are all fine. In fact, on their own, they're very good. But they're still focusing on us striving. 
there's me pulling a plane which landed on Ronald's way this morning. <laughs> and as you see, I'm striving as it is just a touch, touch bigger than me. But striving, the de dictionary definition, is to exert much effort or energy, to struggle or fight forcefully. I may have laboured the point a little bit this morning, but what I want to do is p paint a picture of us relying on our own strength. Each year is an opportunity for new beginnings and a fresh start. But then again, so is each week. And every Sunday is the first day of a new week. Actually, every day is an opportunity for a new beginning. As it says in Lamentations, God's mercies are new every morning. So this is to encourage you not to belittle you if you've done something and not kept it so far this year. But as Christians, first and foremost, we're called to abide in Christ. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? To abide is to live, to continue, or to remain. So to abide in Christ is to live in him or remain in him. When a person is saved and gives their lives to Jesus, he or she is described as being in Christ. A couple of verses there. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Building up a picture of a secure relationship. In John 10, 28 29, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Interesting, we were talking about snatching earlier. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. But abiding in Christ is not a, a special level of Christian experience which uh, you grow to after 3, 5, 10, 15 years, available to only a few of us. Rather, it's a position of all true believers, and I say true believers. The difference between those abiding in Christ and those not abiding in Christ is really the difference between those who've been saved and those who are unsaved. The day you are saved and accept Jesus into your life, you start to abide in Christ as the word abide also means to continue or to remain, it is only the start of abiding in Christ. It's a bit like when you have a wedding day, you get married that day, but that's only the start of your marriage, and hopefully you'll go on to have a long, fruitful marriage. Just moving on to 1 John 2, 1-6 where the link is made between being in Christ and obeying his commands. My dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Later in the same chapter, John equates remaining in the Father and the Son with having the promise of eternal life. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promises to us, eternal life. So hopefully, we're getting the picture that the phrase abiding in Christ is an intimate, close relationship with Jesus Christ and not just a superficial nodding acquaintance oh I know him hello and move on in your life it's that close intimate relationship so let's just recap on John 15 4 to 7 which we start off in remain in me as I also remain in you no branch can bear fruit by itself it must remain in the vine neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Here, Jesus is telling his disciples that having salvation is essential using the pictures of branches united to, branches united to a vine. No matter how strong the branch is, unless it's connected to the vine, it won't bear any fruit. Without the vital union with Christ, which salvation provides, there can be no life and no productivity. Elsewhere, the Bible likens this union to that of the head and the body, which is in Colossians 1.18. So what would the evidence look like that somebody is abiding in Christ? We've probably touched on a couple of points already. But let me just bring a few more out. Obedience to Christ's commands. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus, sorry, John 15, 10. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. 1 John 3, 24. The second point will be following Jesus' example. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Lots of people probably wear bracelets or other things with WWJD. What would Jesus do? But actually, it's scriptural there. We must live as Jesus lived. That's a high calling in all our lives and a very big challenge. Living free from habitual sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. 1 John 3, 6. That's a powerful statement. But we've seen this morning, Jesus gives people the power to break free from habitual sin. Awareness of the Holy Spirit in one's life. It says in 1 John 4, 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So hopefully we're starting to paint a picture of what it actually means to abide in Christ. So let's just take a few, a, a little bit of time to, to try and picture what that means. One of my favourite passages in, in the New Testament is in Luke 10 and the picture of Mary and Martha. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had, called, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I've got to just say, that's been me so many times. For people who know me, I'm Mr. Action Point Man. Um, and you can get caught up in the busyness of doing things for God and doing some good things. But actually, the best thing is to ensure you're prioritizing time with God. So let's look at practically some ways we can do this. The first one is prayer. It's not only a need, but it's also a major opportunity for us. We need to be constantly connected to the Lord. That doesn't mean five minutes in the morning, and that's a ticked off your list. Constantly connecting with the Lord. Jesus prayed whilst he was on earth and taught us to pray. If Jesus felt the need for prayer, well, surely we need to pray even more. God cares about you and everything that happens to you, from the smallest plea to the biggest need. What an opportunity we have there. He is always listening and knows your needs, even if, quite often, it may feel like he doesn't. 
Psalm 55, 22 says that if you cast your burden on the Lord, then he will sustain you. Prayer is both telling God about goals in your life, asking f- for him to make you more like him. And it's also outward focus, praying for those in our life group, in our church, in the wider community, across the earth. But focusing on the individual person here, that's why it's so important to ask for God's blessing before you open the Bible and ask him to speak to you through his, his word. I also really like what Chris said last week, that we have two ears and one mouth and use them in that proportion. How often does somebody go and pray, spend five minutes reading off a list of things they want to tell God about and then quickly run out the room before God can speak to them? We do need to create time in prayer to allow Jesus to speak to us as well as us speak to him. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. The second way is read the Bible. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? And to me, a young person is anyone under 100, so it applies to all of us. (laughs) (laughs) setting aside time every day for the bible is extremely important keep your mind fixed on it and allow your heart to be grafted to christ and molded by it the bible is god's word it's god's word and in it the story of god's redeeming work in this world is told as you begin to see your place in God's story, you'll see why your life matters and where it's going. By reading the Bible, you open your ears to listen to God. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Give thanks and rejoice. In James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father. What reasons do we have to be thankful? Anyone shout out a reason to be thankful? We have a new life in Jesus. Perfect. Any more? Music. Music. More? Family. Family. Friends. Perfect. More? Health. Exactly. In fact, I could probably spend another 15 minutes people shouting out. There's hundreds and thousands of reasons to be thankful for God. The forgiveness of sins, the power to overcome evil as well. The greatest reason to to constantly rejoice and thank God is that if you are truly trusting in Jesus, then you'll be resurrected in the last day with him and enjoy eternal life with him. Surely there is no better help than that, no better hope than that. The next one is don't fight in your own strength. And this one, which is, I think is for me personally as well. For though we live in the world, we do not wage, world, wage war as the world does. On the screen is a picture of the B-17. During World War II, Allied bombers carried machine guns in the nose, under the belly, on top, and in the rear. These were known as flying fortresses. They carried 13 0.5 caliber machine guns. Many scientists actually suggested that the planes would actually be safer without the guns. Without the extra weight needed to operate the guns, they could fly faster, higher, and therefore increase their odds of survival. The pilots obviously knew best, though, and they thought differently. They wouldn't even consider embarking on a mission without guns to shoot back and defend themselves. I think we make that choice quite often. We make the same choice when it comes to fighting our own battles. God says we don't need guns. We can soar higher and faster with, that, with him. As I start off, for though, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons he gives us have divine power to demolish strongholds. We don't need the weapons of the world. 
That's in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10. But we actually say no thanks. We can shoot back ourselves. We can defend ourselves. Angry words always help. Demanding attitudes. Manipulative behaviours. Excessive excuses. Bombs of blame. You could probably actually watch a Premier League football match and see all of those taking place in about the space of five minutes. <laughs> but it takes courage to stop using the weapons of flesh. Take up the shield of faith and arm ourselves with the weapons of God, Ephesians 6.16. It's a kind of faith that David showed when he told Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear, but I come against you, I come against you, not in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. So whilst he was fighting Goliath, he wasn't doing it in his own strength. He was doing it in the Lord's strength. Stop fighting in your own strength and let God's spiritual arsenal defend you. He is a shield to take those, for those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 35. So there we've got this picture of we're much better in taking a step back, taking a breath, and letting God fight our battles rather than us fight our battles. And I think that's probably one I still need to hear every day. Those have mainly focused on our relationship with God, but we're also called to enjoy fellowship. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, and I know Jonathan may not like me going there, but koinonia refers to the relationship we are called to have with the Lord and the relationship we are called to have with each other. It's the same word. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he said, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Make a request, if by some means, now that I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Paul talks about three things there, which we owe each other. Let's look at them. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. You can show no greater love and concern for someone than saying, I'm going to pray for you, and then obviously do it. Prayer invites God into the situation and authorises the forces of heaven to go to work and bring change. Secondly, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. What did Paul long for? The chance to strengthen his fellow believers. And he was willing to travel a long way at great personal risk to do so. When two people decide to recognise and nurture the God-given gifts in each other, not only are they best blessed personally, everybody else around them is blessed too. That I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Notice the words encouraged and mutual faith. In this passage, there are powerful dynamics at work. 
First, we pray for one another. Second, we recognize and nurture God's gifts in one another. Third, we unite our faith and focus on a shared goal. Jesus said, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my na- together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That's in Matthew 18. So the ideal place to enjoy such fellowship is in our life groups. All our life groups meet meet once a week for the group to come together as a whole. But also the life groups are meeting daily, sharing life with each other. And I'd really encourage you that if you want to step forward and continue to abide more and more in Christ, that you make your life group a priority. And if you're not in a life group, Come and speak to me or one of the leaders at the end and we'll, we'll get you into a life group. It is so important for you. And the last thing I, I want to bring is a picture of a frog, which is a little bit abstract, but I'm hoping it's abstract enough to, to stick in your mind. What does frog stand for? Fully rely on God. Fully rely on God. It took, it took me hours to work that one out. <laughs> but I think that's, that's for a whole range of people. For people who've not yet given their lives to Christ. But also for people who've been Christians for 20, 30, probably in some cases, longer years. Are we really fully relying on God? Could I just ask one of the keyboard players to come back up, please? I know we've asked already this morning, does anyone want to give their lives to Christ? For those who, who do not yet know Jesus. But to me, and to all Christians, there is no greater privilege than leading somebody to an eternal life in Christ. So I want to make the opportunity again. The slide shows the gap that separates God and people. And this is because of the sin in our lives. The just of God demands a sacrifice for man's sin. Jesus Christ became that sacrifice and paid the penalty for our sin at the cross. Christ dies on the cross so that that we could receive forgiveness of our sins and be reconciled to God and have eternal life. We receive salvation when we stop trusting in ourselves and put our trust in God and what Christ did for us on the cross. Our salvation is a result of God's grace. It's not something we can earn. As we read in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So could I just ask everyone to stand, please? And can I just ask for... Every head to be bowed and every eyes closed, please. Because I would like to ask, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? Just to repeat John 4, 16, 14, 6. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
So if you're here this morning, and this message has been speaking to you, and you don't, know, you don't yet know Jesus, I want to ask Jesus into your life. Could I just ask you to raise your hand now, please, where you are? Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you to that man who raised his hand. I'll just ask one of the leaders to come and pray the prayer of salvation with you. But I do sense there's a greater need for us all to repent this morning. Going back to the picture of the frog, are we fully, fully relying on God? At the start, I was talking about striving or abiding. How many of you, how many of us have been striving this week? Striving in our own power. How many of us have been fully abiding in Jesus? So I'd just like to raise your hand if you want to say, sorry, Lord, I've been striving and not fully abiding in you. And what I'd like to do is just lead us in a prayer. So if you can say after me, dear Jesus, Jesus. we thank you for for your place in our lives. We thank you for your place in our lives. We thank you that you are with us every moment of every day. We thank you that you are with us every moment of every day. We thank you for the Holy Spirit which is inside us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who is inside us. We thank you for your power. Thank you for your power. We want to rely more on your power. We want to rely more on your power. And less on our power. Less on our power. We wish you to help us every minute of every day. We wish you to help us every minute of each day. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I just sense that there's probably some of you who probably want to break free of maybe some of the areas we were talking about. Habitual sin, uh, fighting in your own strength. And if that's you, I'd like you to come down to the front and there'll be some of the leaders here to pray for you. As I said in Lamentations, Your, your mercies are new every day. So this is your chance. This is your chance to have somebody to, to stand by you, to pray for you, to help you become accountable, to break that f- stronghold or foothold. But you need to move forward. We've talked about fully relying on God. Please don't be shy.